Yeah. Uh, David Young and Gene Raddick, uh, looks like they already have handed out three by five cards for you to write any questions you might have of our panelists. Um, as you listen to this panel discussion, you are encouraged to listen for a story that you can bring back to your own congregation. This is not just for you, but something for you to share with your congregation. So listen for a story that you can tell. And finally, quoting Dr. Combs, if America has the courage to confront the great sin and ongoing legacy of white supremacy with repentance and reparation, there is hope beyond tragedy. That is why we're here this morning. When we started talking about the, the need to focus on race, part of the thought was that, well, you know, maybe we have to raise our level of understanding that this is still truly an issue we struggle with. I think the last few months um, have taught us that we are fully aware now that this is an issue we are still struggling with. And so we really are appreciative of these three who have traveled here um, to be with us, uh, the Presbytery of Newton, to uh, share. What I'm going to do is a brief uh, introduction of each person. And then we're going to ask them to share just about five or seven minutes their own experience of uh, being in this part of the country, what, it, what it's meant to them and how they have experienced that time, and maybe just share a little bit about uh, what they're involved in personally. Uh, we've asked them to keep those about five to seven minutes, um, and then we have some questions that we're going to have them all share around. So I don't know if this is... I don't know. Oh, maybe. It is. Yes. It, it, it is? Maybe just turned up a little bit? Uh, you don't need it. <laughs> I'm okay. I don't know about these guys. <laughs> uh, Amore Tanta Sanchez has already been involved in our life as a Presbyterian, and he's been with the uh, Cinema Northeast for uh, about four months only, so, so this is great to have that opportunity to spend time with him. Uh, grew up in Puerto Rico. Um, there we go, is that better? All right. And before coming to the Senate, had been at Princeton Seminary, uh, working in the continuing ed area. Um, he attended Princeton and also New Brunswick, New Brunswick Seminary, so it's just great to uh, have you here. And Jackie Zapata um, is uh, from the Morris, General Morristown area right now. And uh, Jackie, uh, her background educationally, she has a degree in criminal justice and English and is working now on a master's degree in law and governance. But it was with an organization called Wind of the Spirit um, that works with immigration issues. And so when she introduces herself, we definitely want her to share a little more about what this organization is doing. And I think you will be surprised what's going on in our general area of New Jersey. So we're very happy that Jackie was willing to come and have gotten to know her um, over the last uh, few months. Now, Sidney Williams, this gentleman sitting in the middle here, um, is the pastor of the Bethel uh, AME Church in Morristown. Um, Sidney and I actually have become very good friends. We arrived in Morristown almost exactly the, uh, to the day. And uh, we have uh, had the pri privilege of spending a lot of time together. And uh, Sidney has an incredible background. He uh, was on Wall Street. Uh, for some years and, and involved with some firms on Wall Street. And so now he speaks and writes on that intersection of uh, religion and finance. Uh, how, how do we synthesize those two together? Um, we, we've had this friendship and our churches have had this friendship. Uh, Sydney has an MBA from uh, Wharton School of Business and then Wesley Seminary. He, uh, he attended Wesley Seminary as well. And I'm always in awe of Sydney because of all that he does, all that his church is involved in doing, and in the relationship our two congregations have had, um, they truly are probably doing more mentoring for us uh, than we're able to do much uh, in our relationship for them, so it's been great. And, and because Sydney and I spend so much time together, he's always fascinated about what we do as Presbyterians. So he, does, he, he never quite... Here you go. He never quite quite gets it, and so when he came in, I was explaining what the presbytery was, and it's, it, you know, it's better maybe not to know, right? <laughs> so, as I said, we're going to ask each person to do a uh, just five or to seven minute kind of personal uh, experience and some things that they may want to share, and then we'll do some questions for them.
Um, thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm glad I'm speaking first because I, I, hopefully I'll give you the, the larger regional overview of what your fellow Presbyterians or yourselves have been working on regarding race uh, and racism and race relations. Um, and hopefully we'll get them more honed in to our region in, here in the northwest part of the city of New Jersey and um, have a deeper conversation. For the past four years ago, let me, uh, let me narrate this story. Four years ago, um, a group of leaders from throughout the, the Synod were strongly pushing for the dissolution of Synods, including the Synod of the Northeast, right? Um, many, many, many of you, including myself, who have been active in church life, um, did not understand the importance of this second tier level of regional governance um, that just seemed to be a wall between presbyteries and the General Assembly, right? Um, and what happened was that we identified a make it or break it moment. Let's just try to bring somebody to help us think through what in the world is it that we are as a group of presbyteries coming together in the Northeast. And perhaps we'll find a way, perhaps we just decide to do what we're all thinking that we're all, we ought to be doing um, and just get rid of all of this and done, right? General Assembly passed the vote at the, from the council, uh, the division did, did, did not pass on that General Assembly. And four years later, um, 22 presbyteries, including the presbytery of Newton, and around 1,100 congregations, um, about 180,000 worshiping presbyterians, um, decided, you know what, this second tier of governance might work better if we call it a gathering of presbyterians in presbyterians and congregations to come together in joint mission and work and struggle real deeply, sharing that struggle in our quest to understand what it is that we're called to be as, as children of Jesus, uh, children of God in this region, right? As we were doing that, the group that was identified to write the new strategy, which is called the New Way Forward, and you can find in the Senate website, out of which um, the gentlewoman who at the, introduced uh, this uh, section at the beginning read the mission of, uh, portion of it, um, thought that it was important not only to define um, or loosely defined, I should say, what is it that we see ourselves as a community, but what have been the things that we have been doing well in the witness of Jesus Christ as Presbyterians in the Northeast, <coughs> but also things that we might need to work on um, in our witness and our engagement. And the one thing that we identified that, that all of you told the Synod um, was of value in the Synod of the Northeast that is probably particular to our community in, in, in the Northeast, if not unique, it's, it's diversity. We know we live within one of the most diverse regions, if not the most diverse region in the United States. We know that diversity is manifested within our congregations, but we are also aware that it should be more represented and active in our church life. So we have not done a lot of the work that we should have been doing within this gift of diversity that exists within the communities we serve, but not necessarily within the communities that gather to worship under our Reformed tradition and the Presbyterian Church of right? That is perhaps our single most important value um, in, our, in our community. One of the things that then, when the Senate Assembly uh, approved the, the, the new way forward, was that we were going to encourage congregations, presbyteries, and the whole Senate to enter into deep conversations not only about that diversity that we know it's out there, but many of us just don't have any idea how to engage, you know, but also to talk about the privilege that is inherent within a denomination that is 95% white, and white, not, I just, yeah, white, uh, mostly of Western European descent that worships. And what does that signal and witness to the world? we are seeking and wanting to serve, right? So that's where the Dick Stone conversation happened. A lot of your folks uh, went to that uh, conversation and we're really grateful about Newton Presbyterian's engagement into that. Um, I am here, uh, hopefully, to give some light into what the Synod is doing and the hope of that the Newton Presbyterian is bringing to the whole Synod. Um, you, you have been doing deep work, truly. And, and we, are, we have taken heed of that, and we're communicating that to the rest of our, of our presbyteries. Um, more than talking to you, I am hoping to talk with you, and more importantly, to learn from you. 
what is it that you guys have been doing and how we can lead our Presbyterian presence within the Northeast to engage in this very important, again, not only to confess the sin of white privilege, but more importantly, how do we decide to engage, not to, but <coughs> with those others that are so important that are making up our communities uh, around us. I am really thankful. I'm looking forward for the conversation. Thank you. Glad to be with you all today. Um, I was asking David upon arrival how deep did the waters go here, and I asked if I could share something from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to help us frame the conversation, so that would be all right. I'd like to share. This is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Creation and Fall, and I like these particular, this particular passage. Freedom is not a quality human, a human being has. It is not an ability a capacity, an attribute of being that may be deeply hidden in a person that can somehow be uncovered. Anyone who scrutinizes human beings in order to find freedom finds nothing of it. Why? Because freedom is not a quality that can be uncovered. It is not a possession, something to hand, an object, nor is it a form of something to, uh, to hand. Instead, it is a relation and nothing else. To be more precise, freedom is a relation between two persons. Being free means being free for the other, because I am bound to the other. Only by being in relation with the other am I free. And so I thought this was interesting to share um, as we try to explore this question. Um, and so our challenge is what are we free for? Uh, Dave mentioned our relationship between Bethel Church and the Marstown, Pres uh, Marstown Presbyterian Church. Uh, Marstown Presbyterian Church is the oldest congregation in Mars County, oldest uh, congregation established by persons of European descent. Our congregation, Bethel AME, is the oldest African American congregation established in Mars County. And surprisingly enough, our founders were members of the Presbyterian Church. But in 1841, when the church split, one of the issues being race, some of the members of that congregation founded Bethel Church, where I'm now a pastor. And so even today, although we've had an Emancipation Proclamation, we've had civil rights, we've, we've disbanded Jim Crow, uh, there's still a tension. And so the question is, what are we free for? Well, we're free to be in relationship with each other. And so, our congregations worship together, we do vacation Bible school together, and we transgress traditions. The Presbyterian Church has been to our church to worship in our tradition, and we've been to their church to worship in their tradition. And I think the freedom comes in being free for others. I think there's a freedom in our congregation to, to transgress culture, or cultural and racial and social boundaries, and to come and worship together and be in each other's presence. And some of the great experiences I've had is to see teachers who teach our children to be able to worship together and know that they're both Christian. To see co-workers and neighbors come together and worship the Christ that we all worship every Sunday but don't speak to each other throughout the week. Um, I've seen people at the altar crying together who have been in Marstown together all of their lives, multi-generational families and not being free for each other. And so I think the power of Christ is that we can be free for each other. Today I applaud you for having this conversation. You were free to do anything you wanted to today to discuss. And you were free for this discussion. And so um, that's what we're up to in Morris County, being free for each other. Um, and then Dave also asked me to give some personal experiences. Um, our four children, three of them, have experienced what I call institutional racism, a really good, caring white people who said that my children were not capable of doing honors level work because they were concerned because we were missionaries in South Africa. Well, you were in an African school. I don't know if you can do the work here in Morris County. And I said, well, you should know they were in a British school, which I think probably has a better quality education than what we have in America. And so we went along with their judgment of our children. And for that first year, um, our oldest daughter got all A's. And so the second year, we asked, can she now be placed in honors courses? And that good, caring white teacher said, well, she's not capable of doing that level of work. 
And I said, well, what assessment did you perform and when was that going to be shared with us? Why did I have to ask the question? And she says, well, I'm the teacher. I know what's best for your child. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> and so we talked to the superintendent and he used his freedom um, to put her in honors classes. And so she proceeded to be in all honors classes and received all A's. When it was time to transition to the high school, um, the Hispanic guidance counselor, who was close to my complexion, said, you know, black and Latino children don't do well in the high school in honors, and so I'm going to recommend she take a few honor courses, but not all honor courses. And my kids know me well, and they were getting nervous. They said, oh, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> and I thanked him for his consideration, but I said, I'm not here to debate with you how black and Latino children perform in high school. I'm talking about my daughter, and quite frankly, I don't need your opinion. And so I called the superintendent again, and he used his freedom to make sure that she was in all honors classes. And she entered high school at age 13, the youngest in the high school, um, Latin and French, um, in all honors courses, and finished the year with a 4.6 GPA, the highest in the school. This year, she continues to be in all honors. And so, yes, racism does abound, and it happens from really nice, good white people who go to church every Sunday and don't really mean to do anything bad, but it's making assumptions about other people's abilities. And so I would, I would challenge us, what are we free for? We have to challenge our own assumptions. And so those are my five to seven minutes I wanted to share. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here, and special thanks to Pastor David for inviting me. Um, like he had mentioned, I am from an organization called Women of the Spirit. We're an immigrant resource center. We're also a grassroots uh, organization um, in Morristown, and we work in Morris County and the surrounding area um, with the immigrant community, um, specifically the undocumented community. Um, and so before I go into um, some of the things we have encountered and um, what we do, I just want to read a few verses. Um, I'm going to read from Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9, that say, um, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And then I'm going to switch over to uh, Romans 10, verse 12, where it says, uh, For there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Um, and I just wanted to share this because I feel like uh, as Christians, this is what we're here for. Uh, we are here to stand up for those who are oppressed, for those who cannot speak for themselves or feel like they are, they are unable to. Um, at Wind of the Spirit, that's what we encounter. Um, we, come, we see community members come into our offices every day who feel like they are unable to and incapable of um, speaking up for themselves because they have been oppressed and they feel oppressed and they feel this weight on them. Um, that their voice does not matter because they are called illegal um, and they are seen as like, subhuman in a sense. Um, and that's who I represent and that's who I'm here to speak on behalf of. Um, so a little bit about Wind of the Spirit. Um, we do several different things. Um, we offer legal services, OSHA trainings, uh, waste protection, and specifically, um, I work with advocacy. Um, I work with, for um, education equality, we're working on state, um, state aid for, for DREAMers, for students who are undocumented. Um, also, I'm working on a driver's license campaign for, um, for everyone, regardless of their legal status in the country. And I work for a campaign called Not One More Deportation, and we fight individual deportation cases. But uh, through all these experiences and campaigns, we hear of racism, and we hear of people being oppressed. And I just wanted to share, um, I'm also from Morristown. I was born in Morristown. Um, I went to school in Dover, which is in Morris County. It's probably like 90% plus Latino. Um, and I am also part of a church in Morristown um, called the Spanish Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Morristown. Um, so I'm very part of the community and I interact a lot with the youth because I'm a youth leader at my church. Um, and just a story I wanted to share um, is one of my, one of my um, youth, her name is Sammy, 
And one day, um, Sammy calls me and she wants to come into my office. And um, Sammy's 13, she's in middle school. And I asked Sammy what's happening, um, what's going on. And she comes like crying out of the bus from her school because there was a group of, of students there who were calling all the Latinos um, illegals and telling them to go back to their country. Um, and these are for like 13 year olds. So we are able to see how early this starts, right? How early um, people's perspectives are like changed in a way where we oppress others, even at that age, by name calling, how this starts with our youth. Um, also, I'm working on a case currently with um, these five women, um, and they work at a plastic making factory, and they are given like the heaviest tasks. They um, <clears throat> actually have been going through a lot of harassment at their workplace for the last five years, and, and they feel oppressed because their supervisors don't care about their voice. Um, so they contacted us and we're helping them, but they feel um, like this is a big issue. A lot of the mechanics who are not Latinos um, call them, by, say uh, racial slurs to them and certain things. And um, this is how I see my community affected. And that's why we're here. And this is why this, is why this matters, because we are called to be their voice, right? Although we might not all look the same, we are called to stand up for those who are being oppressed. Thank you all very much. And, uh, everybody was very, uh, very sensitive at the time. Uh, th just one more story. Sorry to talk about this guy. Uh, Sydney has preached in our church, and the, and the first time we kind of gave him a time limit. He, he was not so sure what, what that really meant. <laughs> <laughs> so you were surprised when you heard five to seven go. <laughs> thank, thank you all very much. And, and you started to kind of lead us. And, Jack, and thank you very much, and lead us where we wanted to go with the first question. Um, shared some personal experiences of you know, how race is still prevalent in central, northwest New Jersey. Um, but we wondered if you know, there's some other examples you can share with us uh, you know, as we begin to become more engaged in this whole situation. You know, it, it's just that basic awareness. Are, are there some other examples that you may have um, that, that you could kind of share? Um, last night we had a um, youth speak out where we allowed the children, we encouraged the children to share how um, the events that took place in Ferguson, Missouri, um, in New York, and Staten Island, and throughout the country. And we really didn't know where it was going to go, we didn't have an agenda, uh, there were no sort of uh, professional speakers invited, we just wanted the children to share. And it became very emotional. One of our youth who goes to Persephone High School, um, another honor student, only African American in the honors program at Persephone High School, she said how much it hurt that although in the news and in the community people are discussing these issues, that it was not discussed in any of her classrooms. And when it was brought up by her, she was told we're not discussing that. And um, they thought that she was being controversial to even bring it up for discussion. And as she began to share, she just became very emotional and just cried about how difficult it is to be in an environment where your identity is really not acknowledged, your pain is not acknowledged. And I thought to myself as she spoke how of a sharp contrast that was to Sandy Hook Elementary School where the clergy council and the whole community, mothers, everyone came together and, and really dealt with the grief that these children may be feeling as a result of what happened in Santa Elementary School. But when it was a black life, regardless of whether his hands are up or not up, or whether he could breathe or he couldn't breathe, the point is there were some emotional issues. And most of us in the Christian faith understand what grieving is. And so to disallow or disavow as if the grieving is not there uh, by teachers, mm -hmm. that's offensive. And then in New York, I saw the news where a bunch of teachers came in the next day, which is we love NYPD, and put it on social media. And so what does that say to the children of Staten Island who really are confused about the grand jury's decision, who are confused by the video they saw on social media, of a man being choked to death by people supposed to serve and protect. 
And so when teachers are insensitive, and while surely we want to pray for our police officers, it was insensitive not to address the pain that these children may be feeling. And so I think we have to be really careful. And then there was a young woman, young white uh, woman, who came from Berkeley Heights who wanted her mom to come with her. This has really touched her emotionally. And she said how shut down she was in her own home by her father, her mother, and her sister who said, we're not discussing that at our dinner table or any other time in our home. And so here you have an African-American child who feels shut down because it can't be discussed, and a young white child who feels shut down because it can't be discussed. And she shared with the young people last night, uh, make people uncomfortable, keep doing it, because as you make other people uncomfortable, they will either deny it um, and walk away, or they may have their eyes open. And so it was really heart-wrenching uh, last night to hear these young children share what it feels like they may be visible. And you, know, you think back to Ralph Ellison and the Invisible Man, or W. Du Bois and Souls of Black Folk, who wrote these texts you know, years ago in the heat of Jim Crow, and to hear young children in Morris County in 2015 still feeling invisible, still feeling like their souls are being um, starved. Um, that, that's sad. And, and we're not even talking about signing a law, signing a bill. We're not talking about crosses burning. We're not talking about lynching. We're talking about having a conversation. We're talking about being willing to listen. How hard is it that, I mean, people fought much harder fights, you know, to abolish slavery, to abolish Jim Crow. And now all we have to do is listen. And we can't even do that in the classroom? That's really, really bad. And so I think we can do better. And no one's asking you to like, you know, go die for it. You know, just be uncomfortable maybe. Um, I just wanted to share uh, a little different um, from the school year. I want to talk a little bit about um, the policing since that's something that's so relevant right now. Um, and <coughs> like I was mentioning, uh, I went to high school in town, uh, Morse County, Dover, and that's kind of like where I grew up. Um, and I've had um, a few encounters with the police where I'm able to have conversations with them and kind of, kind of um, question them and their interactions with the community as well as as community members of their interaction with the with the police, but um, one of my last interactions, um, I had to go to the police department because uh, my dad had lost his citizenship certificate, um, and that we had to go report a lost item. And when we went in, um, I went with my dad, and um, right off the bat, the police officer was kind of like rude to us. Um, like I could feel the sense of like white supremacy by the way he was like talking down to us um, and I confronted him about it and I, I um, started questioning the police officer which he was very like surprised by and I asked him um, I, I'm just wondering because like it um, like was mentioned I studied criminal justice so I kind of know a little bit about like policing style so I asked him was like I'm just wondering um, what's your approach on policing like do you do community policing? Do you are you like foot patrol? Um, do you think that you are approachable to our community? And he was kind of surprised, like, why are you asking me this? And I told him, I was like, well, I came here to report the stolen item, and I don't feel comfortable speaking to you about it because of how because how of how you are acting towards me and my father. Um, and he was very surprised by that, and he kind of then I saw like the nicer side of this officer, um, but it was very interesting, right? Because. I, um, when I started talking to him, I could feel like a little fear and I could feel myself like feel a little like lesser than him. But then I thought about it and I was like, I shouldn't feel this way. Um, and you know, he's here to help and support and that's what I should be seeing him as. Um, because that's what our <coughs> law enforcement officers are here for. We should be able to interact with them comfortably in order for us to address um, our situations with them and I expressed that to him and he was just very surprised um, and um, and I know that's how a lot of our community members feel if not worse than that and that's why there's so many conflicts for example uh, something that we see a lot at one of the spirit is that we have a lot of um, documented folks who, who they drive and, and they don't have a, a valid driver's license um, and when they are pulled over by the police, they are so scared, not only because they have, they don't have.